William Haggis, thank you very much for taking time to speak to us at what is such a worrying, difficult and horrible time, really. How, how are things at your stable? Uh, look, we're all bearing up pretty well. We've got uh, horses to uh, exercise and horses to feed um, because we are in a, a business that deals with livestock. We've got to uh, look after them uh, regardless of the consequent, uh, regardless of what's going on in the outside world, just like farmers have to. So we're doing everything we can to be to stick to the government guidelines and uh, social distancing and keeping everything as clean and as healthy as possible. What, what does it mean for numbers, William, in, in your yard? How many do you employ, for starters? We employ about uh, 80 people. Um, so we haven't had to lay anyone off. Uh, interestingly, we've had more offers of people coming to work here than, than ever. Really? Uh, yeah. And, and I've spoken to a few trainers in the town, they say exactly the same. So it may be the same few people who are going around everyone, but there seems to be a willingness to work. And, you know, providing that we can get going um, uh, uh, sometime in May, then I think the owners will accept that keeping horses in training is the right thing to do. And what about the trainers? I, I read a quote where you said 70% of trainers work to live, full stop. I mean, living's quite hard at the moment. Imagine it's I in there. I fear terribly for oh dear. all trainers who are uh, uh, small in numbers and who rely on owners who have businesses uh, to run. And, you know, you think of the people who own a restaurant and their husband cooks and the wife is front of house and they have no income whatsoever. It's gone from lots to nil in one stroke so i think small trainers are going to be under the cosh um just like small businesses are and and uh you know with people taking horses away or i mean at the moment there's no outlet to sell a horse unless you do it online um so you know it's very hard to know what to do so some you know i think every trainer i've spoken to has had horses taken away in in the right spirit um you know because you know just keeping everyone sort of looking at costs all of us including you and me absolutely it's just the uncertainty yeah that we we all find so hard but and it's a big but to boost morale how good was that your two horses in australia which i have to say we all enjoyed i can't imagine how much you guys enjoyed it looked a bit special yeah it was fantastic and it was a great fillet for us personally and for all of us here and for the boys down in in uh, australia who have been doing such a good job so it was it was terrific it was great viewing uh, it was early in the morning and uh, it was it was fantastic and was for both of them young rascal and a d was was that and uh, knowing you i imagine was quite a long-term plan was it well yeah we we sort of um certainly with the day we after Ascot last year we thought that you know, I was thinking, well, where can he go where he's going to get soft ground? And because he's a gelding, he's no residual value uh, by what he wins and, and win some money. So, you know, he had previously not been quite up to Group 1 standard in Europe or certainly in England. I mean, he ran a magnificent race to finish second to Magical uh, in the champion stakes and on heavy ground, he had a chance of winning one, but... Um, you know they're they're valuable, but but obviously in a, you know if you think of a country around the world where you can get soft ground at a mile and a quarter, well there isn't one. <clears throat> Bar France, Germany, um, and uh, obviously Australia. So so uh, Hong Kong's no go, America's a no go, Singapore's a no go. <coughs> Excuse me. So Australia was the one place where you have a chance of getting rain, and every uh, Sydney championships I've seen at this time of the year that I can remember have been run in torrential rain so that was the sort of plan uh, was started there after he won on the soft in the, in the Wolverton and I've been following the boys on social media actually I think have been terrific with their updates and I have to say the Australians do it very well and are very open and it looks like and you'll probably want to confirm it the plan is all guns for, for this weekend in Sydney is it again? Absolutely and uh, I, we've had a lot, or I've had a lot of calls from the, from the press in um, 
from Australia and I'm delighted to say that they've been uh, very pleased with Harry Eustace in particular and his openness with them, uh, which obviously is very good for all of us up here. So um, that's been excellent. And yes, they worked this morning together and uh, uh, came through. Uh, well, we haven't had the evening stables yet. Uh, uh, sorry, we have had evening stables. We've got morning tomorrow, haven't we? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they seem happy. Um, yeah, everything's everything's hunky dory really. We just need some rain. And and are you watch I thought gonna be my next question actually, are you watching Australian weather forecasts and uh, well, like doing rain morning. dances? But actually I've grown I've grown out of watching too many weather forecasts. My wife watches it all the time in England because frankly uh, they're pretty inaccurate. Um, and uh, they're only good to look at if you're getting what you want. So a forecast, if you want rain and it looks like it's going to rain every day, you keep looking at it. <laughs> but if you want rain and it's got uh, five days of sun, then you can rather give up. So uh, I don't, uh, the rain, there's nothing we can do about the weather. So what will be, will, will be. But if it does rain and the track is genuinely soft, then that gives them both a better chance. Excellent. Well, listen, we all wish you the best of luck. And Thank despite you. my co-presenter, uh, and her knowledge. Mine isn't great in the programme, but it is the Queen Elizabeth Stakes, isn't it? And then the Sydney Cup for Young Rascal? Yeah. Uh, the, the Sydney Cup is up first at 6.15 our time, which is much more civilised this, Very this good. year, uh, this week. Um, and that's a two-mile group one race. And then the QE2 is at uh, five to seven. It's the next race after the Sydney Cup. And let's hope you can give everyone a morale boost again. I must just ask you about the man on board. I thought he was terrific with my limited knowledge. How, how talented is young Tom Marquand, William? Well, he's obviously doing very well. He's in the right place at the moment. Um, he's going down a storm in Australia, but he's been going down a storm in England too for the last couple of years, for like, well, since he emerged from pony racing. And he's a, he's a nice, polite, delightful young man who's doing very well. He's got lots of confidence, as you can imagine. And he's a very strong rider, and he's, um, you know, I've said several times, I believe him to be a, a future champion here, and I hope he stays in England to prove it. Um, we will see. And, and he seems like a really nice young man as well, which is yeah. great. And, and just, he, just finally on Australia, is this something you might do more in the future now? I've got a bit of a taste for this. Oh, for sure. I mean, I've always been up for it. Um, especially in Sydney, but the problem is it's, it's April time and in normal years, you know, you'd be preparing horses um, for a, a spring campaign in, in England. So the fact that these two were both gelded and uh, they would, I mean, Young Rascal, for example, would have run in a John Porter at 34,000 to the winner and he's six to four favourite for a million dollar race. Wow. So, it doesn't need to be, you don't need to be Einstein to work out where we should be. So, <laughs> yes, I'd give it another try. Absolutely. And I, I could, guess everyone else will too. I can quite see why. Um, just before I ask you some quick fire questions, just to pick you up on something you said earlier about May and the uncertainty, do, do you think a resumption in May is, really, is realistic? Um, from all the messages I'm getting, and uh, I speak to lots of people uh, every day, there is a real willingness to start and we are, we as an industry are ready, providing we get the go ahead. But obviously what's happened to the Prime Minister overnight is not helpful. And um, I suspect we're going to go into lockdown for longer. And obviously we won't be able to move until we start seeing a glimmer of hope that lockdown will be uh, relaxed. So. From that point of view, I don't think racing can do anything but wait. But I do feel um, all the right people are making the right noises that a resumption uh, will be possible when the country is allowed to. I think that's spot on. And as, as you say, I think it's really good to be ready. And, and within that, just explain how important it will be for the industry to, to keep the classics in some guise. When that will be, we don't know. Well, that is, that, that, that is crucial. Um, sadly, I don't look like having many participants this year, but that is obviously crucial to the future breed or the future of the breed. Uh, you know, to miss a year with no classic, um, it, it would be a disaster for the industry. Uh, but, you know, we have to get racing as soon as we can because, 
you know, you can't start running a classic probably until a month into the season. So the sooner we start, the sooner we can get those in and get to, back to some sort of normality. But it's going to be a really difficult year. There are lots of horses that the Breeze Up boys have um, that they need to get move on and we need to get into our horses to find out whether they're worth keeping and, you know, before the owners reinvest uh, in, the, in the autumn if there are any left. So it, it's precarious times for us as an industry. But... Let's get it into context, Ed. Um, it's a precarious time for everyone. Well said. And, uh, you know, we've, we've uh, whether it was right or wrong to lock down, every country seems to have done it. It'll be interesting to see what happens in Sweden. But, but we have dug ourselves a big hole now, or the government has, and getting out of it is going to be far more difficult than anyone envisages. So I can't see that we won't be... Uh, I can't see that racing will only... I can see that racing will only take place behind closed doors for a considerable length of time, if not the rest of the year. And whether we will be transporting horses to France to run in their classics or Ireland to run in theirs and vice versa, um, it's hard to envisage at the moment, which means that group races uh, will not be pattern races because they, if that happens, they'll be restricted. So there are lots of... <laughs> lots of problems, lots of issues, and, uh, you know, who knows what will happen. But I don't think anyone knows what's going to happen. And I think, as we said before, I think the most important thing is that we're ready and we have every angle covered when we do start. And it'll be drip-feeding stuff, but we've got to get going and show that we are responsible enough to, to do it without affecting anyone unduly. Are you still on the patent committee yourself, William? I, I have a, yeah, I'm on the patent committee. So, I mean, there have been so many suggestions, haven't there? It sounds like you, you're you more in the sort of Andrew Balding camp of delaying things a few weeks rather than a, I mean... Simon... No, I'm not really like that at all. I don't, I don't see how that could work. Just forget the first one for the season and carry on with the rest of it. I don't, okay. I, I think it's going to be all change. And I think one of the issues in the past that we have, the issues we have all the time on the patent committee is finding a slot for a suitable race, which doesn't interfere with any other country. So, you know, France, uh, you know, they are not going to race their classics uh, uh, in early May. So I'm sure they're going to switch to later in the day, later in the month or later in the year. And will they clash with the English classic? So there's only a certain amount of time that we can get all these races in from each country. So who knows? I think the most important thing for all jurisdictions is to get started. And then once we get started and it's accepted, then we can make some plans. Gosh, what an absolute minefield. Yes, it is a minefield. It really yeah. is. And we had a, a conference call, a patent committee conference call, and we discussed lots of things but we didn't have any answers because, quite frankly, there can't be any answers at this stage. I see, and I think it's difficult. I think, and listen, as you said, until numbers start coming down, none of us can do anything anyway. So that's the got to be the priority, as you said, in perspective. And I think you're spot on. Just, just to finish with William, are you up for a few quick fire questions? We've been asking people on social media if they wanted to ask you any. I've got a couple in amongst them. Are you ready for this? Social media, eh? yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think Haggis Junior is a better on that than uh, Haggis Senior, but there we go. Yeah, he knows what to do. Right, your favourite cricketing memory, please. Either as a player or a spectator, you can have either or both. Uh, Oh, God. You don't give me much warning for this. (laughs) My favourite cricketing memory, oh, I think uh, not as a a player, because I wasn't good enough as a player, but I think uh, the 2005 Ashes series was uh, the best uh, uh, advert for test cricket that you could possibly have. Sportsmanship and fantastic matches that went the whole way. And when you get crowds queuing up on the fifth day of a test match to get in is is a sign that that, is a, that was a fantastic series. And the World Cup final last year where New Zealand were robbed uh, was a fantastic <laughs> match and how sporting in defeat were they I mean they are a credit to the world but New Zealand I mean McCollum's attitude as a captain in years gone by and their 
there, I mean, I can't imagine how we'd have bleated if the result had gone the other way. <laughs> so I think uh, their sportsmanship, I, I'm all lit up for that. And I loved Gilchrist as a player, uh, the, West, uh, the Australian wicketkeeper. Because when he nicked it, he tucked his bat under his arm and went off without looking at the umpire. And, uh, I'm in that school. Class. And I, I was actually down right in front of, do you remember the the left armour he trod on the on the boundary and Guptill straight up said yeah, said absolutely. six. Incredible sportsmanship. Your spot. I thought well, you were well, gonna I thought you were gonna say heading the eighty one, so I would have lost out but Well heading the eighty one was great and we've been watching it recently because it's been on uh, repeat and it was great and uh, and it was fantastic but it was yeah, the two thousand and five series was just unbelievable. Every game was so close, so hard fought it was fantastic fantastic i will tell my 10 year old who watches it regularly to watch the sportsmanship in it i think that's very important who's your favorite sportsman or woman of all time huh. god impossible i suppose i'd have to say my father-in-law but uh, <laughs> you can, you're allowed to say that he was pretty good in this uh, he was a legend in this business um i don't know really it's impossible to pick out um great sportsman there's been some fantastic people but I think I've always thought that a sportsman's greatest attribute is humility and I, I, I think from that point uh, I wouldn't know him from Adam but the way he handles himself I think Federer uh, has been a modern day great because you know when he gets taken to five sets he never says I've got flu or I feel terrible he just says that my opponent gave me a fantastic match. What a great player he is. You know, he's... Class. He, he's class, isn't he? He never sweats. He just gets on. He wins every time. And he's so sporting in defeat. And, well, he's never beaten, but he's so uh, fulsome of his praise of his opponent. Some some quick racing ones for you. Your favourite race course? Uh, well, obviously... Uh, We've had a lot of luck at uh, York, so I'd have to say York, but I love, uh, I, I love obviously, Newmarket because it's close. And I loved Yarmouth, but they shut the fish restaurant uh, <laughs> by the docks, which rather uh, uh, curtailed my trips there. What, what is your favourite r- restaurant around the country near a race course? Well, we were very fond of the fish restaurant at Yarmouth, which was called the fish restaurant, but they closed down. We've been going there for years and years, and most new market trainers used to feed in there before they went to the races, and it was uh, it was fabulous. But it's gone now, so there you go. Thank God they're not going at this time. They would be. Oh involved. God, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Best horse you've seen? Seen. Best horse you've seen? Yeah. Oh, I thought the best race I saw uh, was El Gran Senor's Guineas. That's when I was young and affected by that sort of thing. Uh, best horse. Um, I've always been a more see the stars fan than a Frankel fan. Frankel was very exuberant and obviously a brilliant horse, brilliant horse. But uh, see the stars kept doing it, and I think if he'd stayed in training as a four-year-old, bar the three-year-old only races, he'd have won everything all over again. He and he just turned up. He didn't win by very far. You know, he was fantastic in the arc. And he was just a great horse. And because, a little bit like Black Caviar and Winks, because Winks and Frankel came along so soon after, uh, the the uh, performances of See the Stars and Black Caviar got rather shuffled under the carpet a bit. Um, so I, I thought he was a great horse, See the Stars. Uh, I, I was uh, uh, there on ni- in 1984 when... Um, El Gran Senor beat you singer in the Guineas and that was a fantastic race absolutely fantastic and he was a brilliant horse and a beautiful one too but there would be lots of brilliant horses and my mother had a wonderful uh, jumper who gave us some hope in her life after my father left her called Silverbuck who was a brilliant horse and um, he, he has a very fond place in my heart too Oh, I love that. That was my favourite era because I was more of a jumps man as a, as a yeah, child. Yeah. What an era that was for jumpers. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. What's the most talented horse you've trained? I was asked on Facebook, William. I doubt you're on Facebook. No. Uh, most talented horse 
at Tremont. Well, Charmit must have been talented because he won the Derby first time out and only one other horse has done that in the history of the Derby 200 and however many years it is. Um, he was never the same after, but he must have been a very, very talented horse. And we only had 40 horses then, so... Um, he he was you know way well we did have a couple of other useful horses then to to help him along but he was a very good horse but in the modern day sea of class had had uh, had a turn of foot like any and we haven't trained one with a turn of foot like her and she was a very very classy filly who sadly we lost in tragic circumstances yeah i was going to say she must have given you your some of your best and your saddest day of racing i suppose yeah i was very proud of her even when she was beaten in the arc uh, as disappointed as i was not to win or we were it was you know we were so proud of the way she performed and um you know she was fantastic but james james doyle's ride in the irish oaks what should have been the ride of the year in every um, awards event going because if you watch that how cool was he not to pick his stick up and win by a neck yeah that uh, was fantastic lovely memories can, can I ask you one final personal question because I've often said on TV and, and, and written it as well so I'm not lying I've said if, <laughs> if I had the money which I don't I'd have a horse with you, with you guys because you get you get two trainers for the price of one. I always think. <laughs> could you could you sum up the role? Because I don't think she gets enough credit to sum up your role, the role your wife does play. Um, I think you're better off asking people we've employed over the years. Um, uh, she she's, I mean, uh, her work ethic is indescribable she she never stops and she is a monster on detail and uh, she does all the little things that nobody really wants to do and and the staff know that she would do any job that they do uh, straight away if if she needed to so she has a huge uh, capacity for work she wants everything done as best as we can do it and she doesn't uh, look for glory. I said to her when uh, when uh, we trained a thousand winners, I said, now would you like to take over the license so that you can train a thousand too, if we get that lucky? And uh, she said, absolutely not. And then when the talk last year was of partnerships being formed, I said, would you like to go into partnership? And she said, absolutely not. I said, you're in charge, I'm just here to help. Wow. And uh, she's a remarkable lady, and she still rides out three lots a day, and uh, and she never stops. Goes to bed quite early, but I uh, don't blame her. What, what lovely words. And, and is it true you, you have the great minds meeting, well, I suppose it's difficult at the moment, what's happening, but on a Sunday morning? Yeah, we, yeah, how do you know that? Did some research, William. <laughs> I do occasionally, I promise. Yeah, we sit down every Sunday and just go through uh, what we think we should do with every horse in the week. It's it's quite difficult uh, being a trainer's wife uh, because communication is crucial. But there's so much going on in my tiny little mind that I don't tell everyone everything all the time. And so to be able to sit down in a bit of peace on a Sunday morning for two or three hours and just go through every horse and and I write in pencil what we're going to do with them the following week. I think it changes every day. But because we have so many go out now, I don't have time to tell all the staff what to do every lot. So we write down a work list the night before and what every horse is supposed to do, one counter, two counters, and where they're supposed to do it. Um, my secretary types it up and then uh, uh, everyone, uh, assistants, uh, us, and have a copy. And there's one pinned up on a notice board by our riding out board. And people go and see what they're riding and then look to see what it's doing. And then when I walk around, when they gathered up first lot and say, what are you doing? They tell me what they're doing. And then I can sort it out from there. So it's just finding a system uh, like all these things that suits yourself and uh, you know I marvel when I go up to Kingsley House to watch the Johnstons at work 
because they have a completely different system to us, but it works brilliantly well, and everyone else has a different system. So it's just what you're used to, what we're comfortable with, and, and that works for us. Well, it seemingly works for us. And let's hope soon that system is in full flow again. William, you've been wonderful. Thank you so much. And I, I think you'll probably agree with me that whether it's a trip to Lords or the Derby, Royal Ascot in the future, we're going to appreciate it all the more, aren't we? I think we've, I've been watching uh, some replays on racing TV, actually, Ed, and it's been very interesting to see everyone hugging each other and shaking hands with everyone. And, you know, it seems uncomfortable to watch it now. And it's weird. I know exactly and what you mean. Whether whether uh, whether the world will ever quite be the same in any every way uh, after what's happened, I'm not so sure. And and you know, but lots of things needed correction. The stock market needed correction. The yearling market market needed correction, and we're going to get it. And um, maybe in the years to come, as the Queen said the other night, we'll all be stronger and better for all this. But uh, it's hard to see at the moment. Well, listen, we wish you and all your team the best for the future. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, William. Okay. You're a, See you soon, you're,